Good morning and welcome to our webinar on creating meaning in the face of blood cancer. My name is Jenny Burke and today I'll be hosting this webinar with my Leukemia Foundation colleagues Linda Saunders and Megan Moore. And we're joined today by Josh Gourlay, Kate Ray and Dr Carrie Lethborg who will be our presenter. The Leukemia Foundation acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout the various lands we're coming together on today. And we recognise their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our deep respects to their elders past and present. And we understand that they hold the stories, the traditions, the culture and the hope of their people. So a couple of quick things to let you know that the chat function is live at the bottom of your screen there. And you can add a question or a comment at any time throughout today. And obviously, I know you'll all be respectful of comments and be considerate in your questions. We'll hold all our questions to the end of the session when we'll have a Q&A. And for the best experience, you may prefer to put your screen to speaker view. So in bringing this topic to you today, we've recognised that major life changes can bring into focus what is important in your life, what matters the most, and what perhaps brings you joy or pleasure or relief. However, those big changes can also give rise to a sense of having little or no purpose or meaning, especially with the uncertainty that can come with living with a blood cancer or a blood disorder. So research has found that the presence of meaning in a person's life increases your quality of life and in a setting of cancer, it can be predictive of well-being. So today we'll be exploring meaning-based therapy and what practical solutions the research tells us can lead to improving health and well-being. So today we are very fortunate to have two gifted presenters tell us a little of their story and set the scene. So firstly, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Josh. Josh describes himself as a chaotically optimistic blood cancer conqueror, an avid gamer and a traveller with an unhealthy obsession with Pokemon cards. He likes early dinners, long walks on the beach, but not too long, and pretending to go to the gym. So, Josh, over to you. Thank you. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to share a bit of a reflection um, of my last couple of years. So what has cancer taught me about life? Disappointingly, it's about as cliche as you'd expect. There weren't any earth shattering revelations and there certainly weren't any light bulb moments. Mystery of life still eludes me. But really the cliche itself is beautiful. It puts things into perspective in a way that unless you've stared death directly in the face and punched it square between the eyes, those words won't ever truly be appreciated. The cliche is a cliche and it's beautiful. Live life to the fullest, take chances, take risks, don't be afraid. Every minute matters. Life is unexpected. Life is short. After having cancer, I kept very quiet for months, slowly rebuilding my life, regaining meaning and purpose and recreating myself after the most difficult years of my life. And there were times where I felt like a phantom there, but never actually present. The magnitude of thoughts, feelings that I couldn't articulate, express or convey for everything I'd managed to achieve, it took more effort than the cancer itself. I kept writing, I blogged my thoughts and feelings. They kept me accountable and gave me that freedom for my own thoughts. It gave me permission to live and to keep living so that in 20 years time, I can reflect and see just how far I've come and to know that I never let cancer win. Remission is a magic word, hope and fear intertwined. People think that because the cancer's gone, you're expected to go back to being exactly how you were, like nothing ever changed, like you are totally 100% fine, like your body wasn't destroyed, bringing you to the brink of death, and then by somehow, some miracle, you survived. You become a phoenix and you get to start again. I had to teach my body to get all I used to do because like a computer having a master reset, your body is exactly the same. And with that, you have to reconcile that your body and your mind just can't do all it used to do. It's just not quite the same. Not many understand it. I started exercising, walking, going to the gym. 
exploring new places and finding beauty in places in ways I never saw before. Step by step, I felt my body getting back to how I remembered. Still not quite the same, but it's still mine. On reflection, three years have passed since my diagnosis. That time doesn't feel like my time and it doesn't feel like my story. Am I in denial for what I endured? Have, have I repressed it to the point where I no longer recognise that something could ever happen to me? Maybe. Or maybe it's just another phantom. You know it's there somewhere, somehow. You just don't process that it exists. Two months ago, I celebrated two years in remission. Two years since I had a bone marrow transplant that saved my life and gave me my second chance. Am I making the most out of that? Am I, as the cliche goes, living life to the fullest? Am I taking every chance and making every minute count? I like to hope so. I've reflected on life and my direction, and I promised myself that I would do all that I could to regain my sense of self, that I'd discover what makes me me, to find purpose, meaning, to find worth in myself and discover what I want in life, and to surround myself with the people who love me, value, motivate, and inspire me. My friends and family are my power. And I'm getting there. For everything on all the significant changes in my life, through the upheaval and uncertainty, I've regained a little bit more of my grip on life. The cancer's gone, but I'm not. I'm rediscovering joy in the mundane, safety in words that I write, and comfort in all that was familiar. The same video games, the same countless reruns of The Simpsons, and I find humour amongst the darkness. I'd always worried about becoming critically unwell, and now that I've been there, done that, nothing can stop me. Ironically, my anxieties have gone. Cancer didn't destroy me, but it's always going to be a part of me. It's another phantom, always there, but never seen. I acknowledge its presence, but I'll deny its right to exist again. So what has cancer taught me about having life? It's taught me that life is confusing and exciting. It's beautiful and challenging, and it's full of hope and fear. Life itself is cliche, and it's absolutely wonderful. Thanks, Josh. What a great start. And next, we're going to hear from Kate. Kate lives in Canberra with her, I've got to get all this right, there's a, there's a menagerie, three sons, one dog, two rescue cats, two turtles, three chickens and four rabbits. It's a bit like that Christmas song, isn't it? As the youngest of three children, she's passionate about equality, inclusion and human rights. And before being diagnosed with leukaemia in 2021, Kate worked in both the community sector and government doing research, advocacy, policy and engagement roles to improve access to services for vulnerable people. Right now, Kate is recovering from a bone marrow transplant and searching for her next role. So, Kate. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, now, just am I sharing these slides? Can everyone see those slides? I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Ngunnawal people, also known as Canberra. I'd like to thank the Leukaemia Foundation for inviting me today and all the other really practical and life-affirming support you provide. And I really, really must share with you my fear that I might disappoint you because my curiosity about finding meaning with or after blood cancer far outweighs my knowledge. Finding my meaningful life is an ongoing struggle and ironically one that's been particularly arduous while I was writing this very early on in my leukaemia journey, a very clever leukaemia foundation uh, a consumer in a podcast suggested a good way to start exercising was to just put your sneakers on and see what happens. This approach, eating the elephant one bite at a time, continues to inspire me. It's helped me realise that even with an experience of leukaemia, I can still have a meaningful life, but I need to do this really consciously and one little step at a time, putting on my shoes so I can be in a race, any race, even if it's just a race up the hallway. So here I am. I live with my three mostly adult son and far too many animals. I have a fantastic partner, Kerry, and a small close village of family and friends. I love the water and to draw. I feel happy when cooking for the people I love. I love my garden. I hate gardening. Um, I used to have a career and it ate up my time, my thinking and my energy, but I loved it and the purpose that it gave me. I've also had in 2021 uh, ALL and a bone marrow transplant from my sister Lisa. 
And I choose to put this fact last because in making my own meaning, I refuse to let ALL be the experience that defines me. Finding meaning post-ALL and living with BMT for me is full of tension. I'm still maybe only just grieving and raging about things lost, my career trajectory, once boundless energy, capacity for people and relationships, faith in my body and health, ability to finish a sentence without, you know, forgetting what you're going to say. Um, we can all add to the list, right? And I recognise to have a meaningful life, I have to spend ex time accepting that. While well, the experience of leukaemia has changed me. There are losses I'm grieving, sitting with the discomfort, the psychologist says. But there's also been good things that have come from my ALL experience. I'm trying to be open to those good things. This period of illness and recovery has given me time to step back from life and then make explicit choices about what I want to include in my good life. Obviously, everyone's idea of a good life is different. We all have different goals, preferences, resources, limitations. To stave off what feels like on the not so good days, um, an overwhelming journey, I've developed a bit of a good life ritual, a who, how, when, where and why to work through. So my who is parenting and my other relationships. I find purpose and meaning in my connections to others, including with my animals. So I try to spend some time explicitly nurturing those connections and appreciating what they bring to my life. The how is my values, like going gently in the world. I try to find one way each day to express how I can actually live gentleness. Where is having space, be it home, the water or the bush, to disconnect from appointments and fatigue and medication and work and all the other noises, including that rather loud worry that where I am now is as good as it's going to get, that prevented me from noticing the meaningful things, a place to find context, ponder and reflect. And why? Asking myself uh, if the way I'm spending my time is giving me the things that matter to me. Do they make me feel happy, use my brain and creativity, be healthy, continue to use and develop my skills and my gifts and be connected? And when? Now. Can you hear me stamping my impatient foot, hands on hips? Because leukaemia has put my life on hold and, frankly, I'm really over it. But, but the when has taken me a bit of time, oops, a bit of time to unpack. Sorry, just turning a page that's stuck together. <laughs> um, there is a question I've been trying to answer about when, because right now I'm still dealing with lots of really tangible leukemia-imposed limitations. I imagine as many of us share these, energy finances being immunosuppressed, prednisone and other drugs that make it difficult to be the self you'd like or used to be. How can I still have the life I want despite these limitations? Not tomorrow or when I'm less immunocompromised or more financially stable, but today, now. I'm trying to be explicit about bringing parts of my old life along with my future hopes and dreams into my now. Even in some small way, even with these limitations, this way I can live a meaningful life now. I'm trying to work to accept the limitations, to work with them, to adapt my goals and still get some of the things that make my life good. Here's my example. I love to be in the water. Pre-leukemia, one of my favourite things to do was to body surf until my legs felt like jelly, especially in big surf. I felt joyful and free. When very unwell, I angsted I might never do this again. After my transplant, Hickman Lion's still in, a trip to the beach where I just put my toes in was bliss. Then line out, I went in the water. I nearly sank before I managed to bob around in the ripples, so happy. And while my newly acquired realisation of my mortality has reduced my enthusiasm for big surf, I'm now back to body surfing till my legs feel like jelly. Much smaller waves, bigger joy and boundless freedom because I so appreciate I can still experience the water. Also, in April last year, 15 months post-transplant, I swam at the World Transplant Games. This was fantastic as I felt like I'd left my leukaemia in the pool. Uh, clean up in lane three. 
Not suggesting the world transplant games or body surfing are for everyone. My newly transplanted friend Mel, uh, her goal was to spend more time out of bed than in. Brilliant. It's about making sure you can get a bit of what makes life good. And by the way, the National Transplant Games, just a quick plug, will be in October in Canberra. So if anyone's keen, please um, message me and I'll send information. Um, so the poet Mary Oliver, and please don't switch off at the mention of poetry, having spent her day lying blissfully in the grass, being idle, admiring a grasshopper, asks us, tell me, what should I have done? What do you want to do with this one wild and precious life? I'm trying to challenge the shoulds. Whoops, I missed a slide. I'm trying to challenge the shoulds. Um, the biggest one for me uh, is I should be doing better than this. I'm trying to be explicit, ask questions and notice the good things. Otherwise, it all gets to be fatigue and loss and appointments and medications. As I put my life back together, and try and find my new normal, whatever that means, I feel like I can take all the pieces of me, my relationships, my activities, and choose how I put it back together, bring the things I like to the fore, put the others in the margin, maybe even consciously leave some unhelpful things out. Maybe my positivity is a bit too much for some, <laughs> some days it's a bit too much for me, but I'm trying to see this time in my life provided courtesy of leukaemia as a bit of a privilege. So while I'm still struggling, each day I'm putting on my sneakers. Some days I only manage just the one and see what happens in my one wild and precious life. Thank you. And thanks, Josh. That was brilliant. <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious to see we've got some extraordinary people in our midst who have this incredible knack for articulating what makes bigger joy in our lives and that those things can be very small things, those connections to others, the embracing change um, and the meeting the challenges. So our final speaker today is Dr. Carrie Lithball. And with over 30 years' experience as an oncology social worker, uh, Carrie is a pivotal figure in psycho-oncology in Australia. Her impactful career includes a PhD from the University of Melbourne on the role of meaning in adjustment to cancer, and this resulted in the acclaimed MAP therapy partly developed at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre in New York. Currently, Carrie is the Health Equity Researcher in Social Work at St Vincent's and a Senior Lecturer in Rural Health at the Un University of Tasmania, and she provides staff support for a range of cancer organisations. And thank you, Carrie. Welcome. That was quite amazing, really. I could just leave now after those two presenters because they've kind of covered the gamut of what I was going to say. Um, but what that does is make me feel a little bit like um, I have listened um, because whilst I've worked with people with cancer for over 30 years, I had a dad with cancer, so I've been a carer. Um, I want to really acknowledge that I've never stood in the shoes of someone with cancer. And so whilst I've done a lot of listening and I hope what I present to you today um, comes, uh, you know, across from a, pl a real place of um, resonating with you, um, I do want to really acknowledge that uh, that's not my experience and, and I'm hoping what we what we do is really take on how does this relate to you does it relate to you and how when we get to chat um, you know to want to tease it out a bit more I also want to acknowledge that I am a white middle-aged middle-class female and so I come with all of those preconceived notions of the world um, but I'm someone who tries very hard to not just live within that knowledge and to stand outside of it um, and to understand the different experiences in the world. Um, there's a number of things that Josh um, and Kate said that I'm going to take my glasses off, uh, that just really resonated with me. And I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll relate to them as I go through. Okay, so um, I just want to acknowledge uh, 
the custodians of the land that I'm coming from, which is uh, Luchawita, and to acknowledge the Palawar and Pakana people um, of this land and how much gratitude I have for keeping what is uh, Luchawita is the most incredible place to live such with such beauty. This is a photograph of my daughter um, down with um, mob that we're close to in our family uh, at a place that's very close to um, Mariah Island. And on the 26th of January every year, they choose to celebrate culture on that day. So we, and we're part of a few people that are very lucky to be part of it. Um, and this is, uh, my daughter is, uh, has an, a Eurasian, six, six, six generation Tasmanian mother and a Chinese father. Um, and so I love this photo as much as she loves smoking ceremonies, but this shows in integration of culture and the closeness that we can all learn from each other. So I, it's important for me to acknowledge um, the people of the lands that I live on, which remain stolen land. Okay, so I'm going to be go very quickly with you about a bit of the background of this research from my perspective, and you are all welcome to have my slides, so I won't belabor it. But um, these are a number of publications that have come out of the MAP therapy journey, um, which we've done in a, a lot of it from St Vincent's in Melbourne, uh, from a number of other hospitals in Australia, and from um, Sloan Kettering in New York. And what I want to show you is that this hasn't just come from some kind of nice ideas. It's come from some really deep research that started when I started my PhD, it was 2003. So the first publications in 2006. Um, and it was about trying to understand some of the concepts that are important in this topic. And then we developed that into a therapy. And then we've trialed that therapy and trialed that therapy and trialed that therapy to try and make sure we can really show that it works on one level. Um, having said that, uh, this is about existential therapy that I didn't um, invent or anyone in the, the cancer world. It's just that we've looked at how we can make it matter and understand it from the perspective of someone living with cancer. Right down the bottom, you'll see uh, a study that's ongoing at the moment in uh, at UCLA. So it's in, uh, Can in California and um, two other parts of the states that name uh, names um, escape me at the moment, and it's a psilocybin trial. So using uh, the drug from magic mushrooms, which I have to tell you, my daughters in Tasmania go to Doofs a lot, and there's a lot of magic mushrooms down here. But please don't go and just try them out. Um, but they're using a uh, a study based on what they're calling PMAP, which is psilocybin and MAP therapy. And we're waiting with bated breath to see what comes out of that. So there's lots of work going on in this area. But for me, this question came from my clinical practice and all of the research that I've ever done has. Um, and I remain a clinician at heart. And so what I was finding was that I could sit with people in a lot of their suffering and I could sit with people who were depressed, but I got really stuck when I was sitting with people who would say to me, I've lost meaning. I didn't know what to say. I didn't have any clever thing to do. And that's the reason why I went into this work. And, of course, what I was sitting with was what, um, in parallel, there was work going on around demoralisation. Um, demoralisation, just by definition, is a mental state of lowered morale, poor coping, characterised by feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, loss of meaning and purpose in life. The fortuitous thing is that Professor David Kassane, who was doing the work in this area, um, was also one of my PhD um, supervisors. And so this literally was happening parallel. And whilst demoralisation as a concept of, of when we feel hopeless and helpless um, was has been around forever, it's been talked about, Prior to this work, which was about 20 years ago, it was seen as a, a, a more, a less concerning part of, de of depression. And the work that David Kassane did took it out of 
understanding it as depression and made it clear that it's a separate experience and it's an experience that is really concerning that we need to take seriously. The best way it's been explained to me was by someone who has experienced both demoralisation and depression in their cancer experience. And the way that they described it to me was when they were depressed, they would be sitting on the couch. They'd know that if they got themselves something to eat, if they had a drink, if they rang a friend, if they went and moved, that they would probably feel a bit better. But when they were in demoralisation, there was no point about getting off the couch. And that kind of explained it to me. So that work was kind of going on at the same time. So the concept of meaning can sound like this really nebulous um, concept that's hard to grab hold of and, and therefore hard to, to start going, how do I work on this for me? There's lots of definitions. That this is the one I use. Um, it's by spec and it's got two components to it. So the first part is a cognitive component. It's how do I make sense of this thing that's happening in my life? Now, that doesn't mean that you have to understand why, you have to be okay with it. You just have to get your head around it. And the second part is how do I derive purpose from existence? So how can I work on what is um, matters to me and how do I feel like I matter? So those are the two parts that we're looking at. And when we started, we sat down with lots of people who were living with cancer, different um, phases and stages of cancer, and we just asked them to tell us about their life. And then we tried to put them under domains. And there were three main domains that came up. The first one was suffering. And I have a particular thing about how we don't acknowledge enough the suffering of the cancer experience. I think we downplay it all the time. Um, and I think Josh and Kate just explained some of it in, in really poignant ways. Um, I'm at the same time as doing this work, I'm doing some work on trauma-informed care um, at St Vincent's Hospital. And I believe that having a, a diagnosis of cancer, having to go through the kinds of things that you need to either physically in your life or just internally is traumatic and when we what we know about going through trauma is that it's very hard to process it when you're in the middle of it so often it is once treatment's finished or there's some space that we we're able to look back on it and we may well go I don't even kind of I think Josh was was kind of talking a little bit about that I looking back on that and even kind of get a grasp of that time there's a good reason for that because it was traumatic and you're going through it you are just surviving we can talk about that some more but suffering is a very real part of the life of someone with cancer the life of someone who loves someone with cancer but actually it's a part of it is a part of life anyway the other thing that people talked about was the things they do in life to cope just the thing the normal things that we do to get through the day so when you're in right in the phase of treatment it's you know it's, it's a busy time of coping but it includes picking up the kids paying the bills doing the things that we need to do so people talked about both those concepts but they also talked about meaning and they were lots of the little ordinary meaning that josh and kate has talked to us about and i'll talk about a bit more later but these were the three things that were presented as this is these are the things I'm moving in and out of in my life. So the first really important thing about this is that meaning and suffering coexists and one doesn't rub out the other. Um, but when we are in the midst of deep suffering, it's hard to believe that you can find some meaning still within it. And the fact is we live with both these things and there's it's, sometimes there's almost a pendulum when we move in and out of them. Many of you will have heard of uh, Lucy Kalathini's, um, sorry, Kalanithi's um, TED talk, where she spoke about the experience of uh, living with her husband as he faced the end of his life with cancer and um, then her grief afterwards. And she says, being human doesn't happen despite suffering, it happens within it. 
When we approach suffering together, we choose to not hide from it. Our lives don't diminish, they expand. Living fully means accepting suffering. So whilst I am talking about meaning, it's really important for me to acknowledge the context here that it happens within and alongside and as well as suffering. Viktor Frankl uh, wrote an amazing little book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's a really easy book to read in some ways. Um, the fact that it talks about uh, his experience in Auschwitz means it's not so easy, but um, a little section of that book includes what he, a therapy he developed called logotherapy, and that's from the Greek logos meaning meaning, so it's meaning therapy. Um, and he was one of the first people who kind of turned this into a way of working with people. And what was amazing was that he started as a, a psychoanalyst, he started working on this concept before the war. And then when he was um, a prisoner in Auschwitz, he still thought about it and he it consolidated for him that even living in a place where everyone was starving, in pain, in grief, had no sense of hope that they were ever going to get out, had lost a sense of humanity of the people that were, were there um, around them, he recognised that there was still meaning and there was still a connection with humanity and there was still a thinking back on beautiful things that had happened in their lives. And so he came out um, and then wrote Man's Search for Meaning. And one of the big parts of his conceptualising that, that really helped me when we were at this point was his idea of will to meaning. So Viktor Frankl would say that, that human beings have only two real drives. One is to survive and the other is to find meaning. And that it, it almost doesn't matter what happens to us, we have that drive. So what that meant was it gave me a bit more of an understanding of how we move in and out of these three phases. So you can see these are the three concepts I mentioned before, suffering, coping, meaning. And we drew it in this very old Celtic symbol to try and show that um, this is what happens. So any on any given day, I might wake up with joint pain from treatment that I'm having and feel like I'm in the suffering mode. Um, I might get up and take some medication that I know is going to help some of that, have a warm shower, I'm in the coping mode. And then someone rings and says, do you want to come for a walk? It's a really beautiful day and I feel really loved and I'm in the meaning mode. I move in and out of them all the time. And the next sort of work we did, and I'm not going to go into it because I want to get down to the other part, ask the question of well, what holds people together when they're in and out of these phases. And what we were able to find was that the first one was connection. Connection is about connecting with other human beings, but also feel like feeling like we matter and we know who we are and we love for who, who we are. So it, it doesn't mean that you go and join a group or that you have 100 people in your life. It, it is about connection to humanity. That is, was crucial. Uh, managed physical symptoms, and I would put in there just that we feel physically safe and supported. I'll probably put them up here. And uh, meaning in life. So like we matter, being safe and cared for and having a sense of meaning in our lives. So this enabled us to go, okay, how do we put that into practice? So the thing, the really important thing is that Viktor Frankl, when he talked about meaning in life, it was not about trying to answer the big questions about why am I here? What is my meaning of my life? Do I feel like I need to be able to say I've achieved A, B or C? It's not about that. And it's about some of the stuff that Josh and Kate explained. It's about the pursuit of little meanings or ordinary meaning, like seeing something like a supermoon or a mountain or someone win a football game, you know, whatever that, that feeling of going, wow, life can be amazing. It's about being part of what feels like, you know, the big sky, the big world. This is a photo in Tasmania of um, the bioluminescence that we see in the waterways sometimes. It's about the joy of doing what you love. And this is a photo of it. So what you love might be stage diving. 
Um, but when I look at this guy's face and then I look at the face of the guy down the bottom, it's that feeling. And maybe that feeling comes from, you know, sitting with three of your friends or um, riding a horse or having a whole afternoon to sit down with books. So it's about connecting again with that feeling of doing what you love. It's about play. It's about offering loving kindness to others and stepping outside of um, our what can feel sometimes like a cancer-saturated life. And it's about, you know, one of the things that I think Kate talked really beautifully about was intentionality. So, you know, there are times when we rush through life and if you've ever read the book Tuesdays with Maury, he talked about the fact that most of us are sleepwalking in our life and um, you get a big wake-up call from that sleepwalk when you are hit with a, a diagnosis of cancer. And maybe then you walk through the same garden and now you notice how beautiful a flower is or, you know, what, what is actually around us. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about meaning. Now, in map therapy, the, the term map comes from meaning and purpose, but it's also a bit of a play on words because it was only after we were doing this for a while that I kind of realised when we are getting feedback from people was that to some extent the therapist, so if I'm working with someone, almost maps what I'm hearing is meaningful to to the person I'm working with. So um, that's why I've got this photo here of a mirror. So a lot of the work that I do with asking questions and reflecting back and reflecting back what I see in the person's face and I hear how their energy changes when they're telling me about something in their life, um, hopefully is showing them what their meaning is rather than telling them what is meaningful in life or trying to direct them into a particular way. And I can tell you that with all the people I've worked with, you know, what's meaningful is very different with each person. So, you know, we ask a number of questions and we sit with people and we, we hear them tell us about their story and their narrative and their sense of significance in the world and try and feed back to them what we see um, about meaning and then how to have more of that so that that pendulum of suffering and meaning maybe gets a bit more balanced. Let me tell you very quickly about um, one of the people that I worked with and his name's Joseph. And Joseph uh, was a, became a Supreme Court judge and that was his kind of the pinnacle of his career. That's what he'd aimed for. His father was a judge, his grandfather was a judge and I think his uncle was a judge. Um, he had had what was a would on paper look like a really successful life and he'd enjoyed his life quite a bit. He'd become a judge. He had a wife and three daughters. He lived a comfortable life economically. Um, and he was, he had, when I met him, he'd had lymphoma for six years and he was at the point where the treatment he was being given was no longer fulfilling his quality of life and he had I think he had retired a year earlier and he was struggling a bit. And so one of the nurses said, you know, maybe you'd like to help out on this study about meaning therapy. And so he came along just to benefit my work, I think, at the time. And we just sat down and talked about his life. And he told me about a number of things that he'd achieved, a number of things that he had regretted that he hadn't had time for. Um, and then I asked him what, if he could tell me about one of his earliest memories of being really happy. And he told me about the fact that when he was quite young, he was sent to boarding school, very prestigious boarding school in Victoria, as had all the other generations of his family, the men in his family. Um, and he hated being there, hated being away from his, his mother in particular. But in the summertime, he would go and they would spend summers at the family beach house on the Mornington Peninsula. And he could remember watching people that were boat builders on the sand and how intrigued he was about it. And he, he went into this different space when he was telling me about it. 
And he said, you know, I probably should have been an engineer and built boats. And he laughed. And I said, you know, why is that funny? And he was like, well, that would never, ever have been an option for me. It's okay. I did other things and I did well, but there is no way that would ever be an option. Gosh, I think many of us, either ourselves or we know people who may have gone and done something very different with their life, but just didn't ever feel like that was really on the cards. So during our time of working together, um, Joseph decided that he and his wife would relocate to the beach house, which was still in their family. And he called his daughters and son-in-laws and grandchildren and asked them whenever they had time to come down and help him build a boat. And that's how he wanted to live the rest of his life. And he also, they also took the um, cellar of red wine that had been sitting there gathering dust. It was like, it's time to drink that and it's time to do the thing that actually he always wanted to do. So that's an example of one of the outcomes um, of this work. But of course, it doesn't always have to be something quite specific and reasonably big like that. Um, Maya is, I could tell you a specific story about Maya, but actually I've met lots of Mayas. Most of them, um, this relates to women who come into a cancer experience, go through the exhaustion of it, and then stop and say, I have actually given of myself to everyone else for so long that maybe what is meaningful for me is to actually take some of that back. Now, I say this understanding the reality of responsibilities we have, limitations that we have. I think Kate's talked about them really clearly. Yes, we have to do that within life. Um, but even the acknowledgement that, you know what, I'm going to actually go back and realise that I want to be able to do more gardening or I want to go to the beach once a week. I'm going to start intentionally putting some of those things back in my life because this wake-up call has reminded me to make some of those decisions. So some of the things that I might ask someone um, when I'm working with them in MAP therapy is to think of a photo album of their life with a whole lot of images of them in it as a child, just pictures that they can remember of themselves and to pull out maybe three and tell me about them and then start looking at what was happening, how did you feel, who was around you, those kinds of things. I often ask the question, what is one thing I should know about you? And I think Josh and Kate both talked about one of the really common things that I don't think we focus on enough, and that is that sense of who I am and am I known, are the people around me, do they know who I am and I, am I loved for just who I am? And um, I want to get to know myself better. So I often ask this question, what is one thing I should know about you so that I can maybe start to unravel some of that? The question of what brings you joy, um, we've put the bits of paper on the wall in our house during particular dinner parties. Um, we've had them on walls in cancer centres. We've done this with lots of people. And you just ask what brings you joy and get people to go and write on it. And let me tell you, it includes things like hearing the rain on a tin roof after it's been a really hot day, um, cracking the top of a creme brulee, um, holding someone's hand that we love. Um, it is none of these go, what brings me joy is that I've just made another $100,000 or I'm suddenly a professor or I'm never says that. It says these these crucial, crucial things that I call ordinary meaning that actually is the stuff of what gets us out of bed in the morning and makes life worth living. And this is a an, um, an exercise that we do um, as part of MAP therapy, and I'm going to just read it through. It's one that you know we should spend more time talking to you about, but I think you'll get the gist of it. So we ask people to write down a list of what they do during the week. So the activities that they do, just write it down as a list. And that may well include taxiing kids around if you're in the still in the middle of medical appointments, just how long and how much of life that, that takes out of your life, um, doing the 
dishes, working, whatever it includes. And then prioritise the list in terms of what you spend most of the time doing. That can be telling in itself and we all, we all should do this at regular intervals, I think. And then prioritise them again in terms of what brings you meaning or personal value. And then just stand back and look at them and see, you know, how much time we're doing, stuff that brings us meaning or purpose and stuff that we're just kind of what's taking up our life. Now, there are some people that we have to do a step three, and that is because we look at their list of things that they do and there's hardly anything in there that brings them joy or meaning. Um, and so then we have to go back through, okay, what are some, you know, what's a couple of things we could just slot in there maybe once a week or once a month. Um, like Kate, I have to be at the on, in, by the ocean on some whatever regular basis. I grew up a sandbank away from the ocean and yet I can go for months and be so busy that I don't do that and I need to schedule that in. So maybe it, it's about actually having to rethink some of that, the time that we have. And guess what, Kate? <laughs> This question, beautiful question that Kate shared with us um, by Mary Oliver, it's an important one to put up here for a couple of reasons. Question is, this is your life and what are you going to do with it? Um, but I do think we have to be careful to not think, okay, what's the, the big thing you're going to do with your life? You know, tell us what it is going to be. Because it. I don't think having been read many of Mary Oliver's poems, she would mean that. You have to go, okay, this is the thing that I did and this is the, the impact I made on the world. Um, it is about living intentionally and it's about how do you want to spend your life? You're the one that's got the, you know, the purse in your hand. How are you going to spend it? And so are you going to continue to do a whole lot of things that other people think you should do? Are you going to do things that you have to do without giving yourself any space? Are you going to not think about that I love to lie down and read a book once a week and yet I keep not giving myself time to do that? How are you going to spend this precious life that you have? This is a picture of the Aurora Australis that we also get down here in Luchawita. Um I think it's important to also bring this back to the practicalities of life and it's important to focus on what time frame you can cope with at any given time. So there are some times when actually it's about I can't even think beyond today or I can maybe make plans for the next three months but I you know I've had things thrown at me so much that actually I find it hard to think too far ahead um, and you know, one of the things I know about blood cancers is that there's there's seldom a really clear, right, we've diagnosed, we've treated, it's over, um, or this treatment's going to fix this particular thing. It might be a chronic ongoing thing. So it's hard to sometimes work out what bit I can cope with. Work out what you can cope with right now and just focus on that. So if it is about this meaning stuff, then it might be, um, okay, in this week I'm going to work out one thing or I'm going to start to work towards something. And my final slide, because it's much more important to hear what you guys have to say, is this is how, this is how simple and complicated it is of what I'm trying to say. We need to identify what brings you meaning and work out how to have more of that. It, it's incredibly complicated when we're, we're so, our mind is so loudly busy with everything else to even know what's meaningful to us anymore. Um, or you might know and you need to, it might not be so simple to work out how to have more of it. But that's the crux of it. Work out how to have more than that. Um, and you do that in spite of suffering, in spite of all the limitations. And what we know is that it will rebalance things. Am I in time? Okay. Stop <laughs> sharing. What an extraordinary okay. um, presentation from Josh and Kate and Carrie. Acknowledging that this is not without its challenges and it's not without difficulty 
and it's not without suffering, but within that and perhaps sometimes because of that, there can still be a bit of what makes life good and there can still be joy and wonder. So we've had so many questions and comments in the chat. It's been a delight. I'm going to hand now to Linda so we can open up the conversation and explore more about this. Jen and, yeah, um, my sentiments uh, um, reflect Jen's. Um, we have had a lot of uh, commentary um, in in the chat, um, so I'll, I'll dive right in. Um, <laughs> And I, I think, you know, I think the term carrying, and perhaps I'll start, um, direct this question to you and then invite Kate and Josh um, to respond as well. Um, I think the concept of demoralisation and that sense of, um, uh, you know, um, the pointlessness, the feeling of no point um, to life is um, a very common one. Um, that we hear as well, as well as um, um, what's been um, presented in the chat. But um, how common is it to feel this way after treatment and how can finding meaning really help with this? Thanks, Linda. Um, so I think the percentages when, you know, there, there was a recent... Um, review of all the work that had been done around demoralisation in cancer. And I think the the terms of commonality, it ranged from something like 14% to 46% of people. Um, and, you know, like a lot of this work, even though I have been involved with, you know, scientifically measuring some of this stuff, you kind of go, you know, actually it's just about experience. Um, and I think... Um, I think that the experience of cancer can make your hopes be dashed for most people at times because um, you you had a plan for life and suddenly um, you've had that thrown up in the air. I I also know that you can it can all when it, when it falls back down again. So everything gets thrown up in the air, everything falls back down again. That there can be a, a sense of okay, that was horrible to feel that, but actually. I can still do A, B, or C, or maybe I want to do something different. So I would, I would actually think that most people go through feelings of being demoralised. The definition I put up there for you was a um, a demoralisation syndrome. So you know we all feel depressed, but until we we tick a whole lot of boxes for three weeks, we're not seen as actually given a a, di a diagnosis of depression, but. Um, I think it's much more prevalent than we think it is. That's probably my short answer. Um, and so part of that, I think it's important to know this is really normal. It's normal when your life has been turned upside down for you to question everything. So that part, you know, it's horrible to feel, but it's not, it doesn't mean that you're coping less well than anyone else. Yeah. Um, and in terms of what we do about it, I mean, part of it is normalizing it. Part of it's, being able to talk about it and part of it is going okay yes we're in this suffering let's start to find some bits of joy again I think that's what I would yeah so yeah and I can see Kate your hand up there and I, I actually was going to come to one of the questions that you asked in the chat and Carrie you touched on obviously this it's sometimes it's tricky to differentiate between depression and anxiety and demoralization um, does this paradigm, this approach, um, um, you know, support people who are, um, you know, whether it's um, going through a, you know, a, a type of depression, a clinical depression, and and anxiety? Is is this something that works uh, for for those people? Shall I briefly answer that, and then we'll cut the case? Is that yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and I would add in, I would add into that list depression, anxiety, demoralization, and fatigue, because I think okay. there's a really fine line between mm -hmm. the physical fatigue and what it's like to feel depressed. Yeah. I'm not saying that you will, that they are necessarily linked, unless. But if you leave someone with fatigue for long enough, they'll probably um, get into that place. All of it is just that that physical being. 
you know, knocked over, basically. Um, and yes, I do think that doing two of those things. So when I talked about bringing life back down to the bit you can cope with at the moment, some days that is I can only think about, you know, if I say to you, can you cope between now and dinner time tonight, you probably go, well, yeah, I can. So that's what we focus on. And then what's one little thing you can do that might bring you joy, even though there's a lot of anxiety and you're feeling flat, we could do that too. So yes, I do think that this work helps um, in any of those um, experiences. Great. Kate, did you want to um, expand on that? Well, I'm kind of trying to make a link between a couple, a comment that Josh made as well in that process of demoralization um i think everyone kind of thinks you know people who haven't experienced cancer perhaps that that suffering is happening when you're um right really unwell and in the depths of treatment but for me that demoralization you know having had an acute leukemia you know i just like josh had that phantom bewildered process and now kind of coming up to nearly three years since my diagnosis it's now that I'm going through that and um you know everyone kind of says oh you look so well <laughs> mm-hmm. but but this is almost the the greatest period of suffering and it's not um physical it's psychological yeah. um, and it's that grief and all of those kinds of things so I guess I just was trying to understand or make the comment that as you're trying to find meaning, um, it's not lineal, just how um, very much in some ways you kind of, you expect it to be further along, but in fact that process of making meaning is perhaps for some people more well after that intense period of illness. Um, Yeah. That's yeah. a really great point you raised, Kate, and mm-hmm. I think, and I'll jump to you in just a jiffy, Josh, someone in the audience, I think it was Chad, um, actually said, and I'd like to read it out because I think it's really, I think it really sums up what you're talking about. I'm personally not there yet in finding little meanings in my life. Mm-hmm. I'm still going through the rebuilding, reassessing mm-hmm. and trying to let go of anger for what I perceive mm-hmm. has been lost at this stage. So I think that really encapsulates that 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 what you're saying, Kate. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah. I, I thought that was very poignant. Um, Josh, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I just want to, I just I just throw on the back of what um Kate and um Carrie were saying. For me, I, the the biggest the biggest challenges have come after. Because when you're going through the treatment, you're kind of in, you, you're almost in this autopilot survivorship mode. One day at a time, you're dealing with one day at a time. And for me, I tried not to think too many days ahead because it just, I'd end up spiraling myself down into into a depression. Um, but it's definitely that, that thing that's after the fact when you kind of have to, it's jarring because you've had, you know, six, 12, 18 months of ongoing treatment, tests, appointments, people making a really big fuss about you and your health, checking in on you all the time, all of a sudden it kind of stops. And that in itself is incredibly jarring because you're you're almost you're almost left to kind of navigate, maneuver yourself forward. Um and be like, okay, well what am I what do I do now? Like what am I supposed to do? I need someone to tell me what I'm supposed to do because for the longest time I've had everyone tell me what to do. And and then you do get the the comments from people like, oh, but you're fine. Everything's fine now. You're going to be okay. You're looking so well. Like, yeah. I can't believe you've been through what you've been through. It's <laughs> lovely to hear, but it's also incredibly invalidating as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, please don't, like, I appreciate it, but please don't be dismissive of what I'm saying. I'm trying to process all these things in my head. And when I say to you, well, yeah, I'm fine for now, but like I still have to live with all of this. Like just because just because I look okay, mentally I might be having a really bad day and just in the depths of despair thinking to myself, what's the point? Like I have to live like this now. And um it's yeah, it's just it's just really just fascinating, just that and the concept of demoralization as well. It's just 
very challenging post, I think. I think that's the biggest period where it's the most challenging. And honestly, I don't think there's any time frame to, for people to be at any point of yeah. their 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 mental recovery in terms of the trauma we've all been to. Everyone does things differently. We all process things differently. We have different ways of dealing with things. And it might take what might take me six months might take another person one month or one year. And it's an ongoing thing. We're always going to be going through it. Like there's never going to be a moment where like, oh, I'm fine. Everything is perfect. I don't think there'll ever be that moment. Yeah. Can I add to that? Sorry, Carrie. No, when you finish responding, Linda. I was just going to say, yeah, I think that really illustrates just that it isn't a linear process and it is just so different for everyone. And you can't, and you, and comparing yourself to others, I think is, you know, um, and seeing how others are doing it, you know, can often be um, counterproductive. Um, and the other, the other thing I just wanted to say, and I think it's something you said, Carrie, around um, suffering um, and I, and that it's, often it is it isn't acknowledged enough um as josh and kate have so um you know um, rightly pointed out after the treatment it's that's that's often when you're processing you know uh, everything that's happened and the trauma of of the experience and whereas everyone else has a different expectation that you are now moving on um, moving on in the world and and the, and the suffering is no longer there you suffered during the treatment but you know um, we've moved you've moved away from that so um, yeah I'm, I'm glad we're really acknowledging that mm -hmm. that um, that concept so first of all I, as a health professional working in this area I want to apologize and I've done this before um, to all of you for the fact that we we set you up to almost head into the post-treatment phase without warning you that this is going to happen, without we, we go on to the next person that's just been newly diagnosed. We don't support your family and say we know that you've put in all of this help, but let's just explain, you know, they have been through a trauma, as have families and friends, and while you're going through a trauma, um, someone once described it to me like, you know, a racehorse. They put blinkers on racehorses so they can just focus on where they've got to go because you might, you're aware that people around you are upset and worried that you've got more treatment to do, that you might have to leave your job at the moment, but you cannot think about any of that because you've just got to get through this treatment and this this phase where you are full of fear and anger and all of that. And we need to actually be saying that. And when you finish treatment, not going, yay, you finished treatment, isn't that great? And ring a bell and <laughs> and not help you to realise that now there's a next phase and this, this is what might help during that phase and these are the services that are going to help you. We The fact that we still don't do that and we have worked this out a while back, um, I am really sorry that we're still not setting, we're setting you up to, to walk into that. Um, the, one of the really important quotes that I've learned about trauma is um, um, that trauma is not what happens to you, it's, what's, it's what happens inside you when it happens. And what that means is that the, that trauma is invisible to everyone else. So I might come in and say to you, um, you know, what this treatment's going really well, but we're actually another one you can start when this one finishes. And you might go, oh god but we say it and we feel really good and we walk out and we get on with our day and we don't even think about all of those things e equally when someone says but you look so good you're doing really well you must be so grateful <laughs> um what that does to you inside and you get one after the other and after the other of those traumatic experiences and of course that's you it's only when you can come up for air and you are you feel safe enough if I can boldly use that term from that panic of am I going to die what's this going to mean for me when you finally got enough space from that terrifying moment and you look up um of course that's when it's going to hit you and you then you go okay what's this mean for my life and 
do I even like my friends anymore or who was there for me and who wasn't there for me, all that pain, um, and then start moving. Um, and that, so, so that actually, it's really, that's, we need to normalise that. Anyway, I'm going to pull back because I think Kate wants to say something. But, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, Carrie, thanks for acknowledging that. That's a really validating thing to hear because just following on from what Josh was saying, if somebody had... It, what's the one thing I wish I knew, I know now that I wish I knew then, that it's not this lineal process, that um, recovery, that finding meaning, that uh, having a good day, that your new normal, whatever you want to call it, is not lineal. Um, for me, I have this image of um, marathon running up mountains and you you get to the top of a mountain and you think you're there, but there's just this whole line of other mountains that you've got to keep running up. And um, so that suffering, even though you're well, and I don't see myself as someone, you know, deeply suffering or anything like that, but even though you're well, it's still really bloody hard and I thought it would be easier than this by now. So to have that validation is actually really meaningful, not because I want to kind of be woe is me, but to kind of go, actually, I've got this. I'm all right. I'm doing okay. Um, so I can have some reasonable expectations about what my life might look like realistically moving forward. And that's fabulous weeks. And then next week, a terrible week of GVHD and no energy. And then next week, well, yeah, you know, I've just swum 50 laps and that felt really good. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's it. So I really appreciate that validation. I think it's, um, I wish that clinicians would do it more. I wish that we would be told more what we can expect and maybe you know that new normal phrase gets flashed around and it's very empty um and very frustrating yeah josh did you want to add to that um, <laughs> I, yeah look I'm, I'm just kind of following on what carrie was saying um about the 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 fringe the friend side of thing and also um, a comment in the in the chat about it as well and like one thing that took me quite some time to process in in the moment so going through that whole you know survivor mode day by day but even in the aftermath like the your friends and your family that are there and that aren't there that maybe when you would have expected them to be and it took me quite a long time to really kind of get to the root of why I felt so uncomfortable about the expectation that I had on my friends and my family and it was the like what the moment for me was recognizing that hold on a second yes i am the person going through this yes i am the person who has to live with the unknown the treatments the the tests in myself even on a day-by-day -day basis i i could deal with that i could deal with it day by day but everybody else around me was processing it and trying to deal with it in their own way as well and some people just find it they don't know what to do they don't know what to say they find it too confronting they're worried about saying the wrong thing or upsetting you or insulting you or maybe even sounding like they're being dismissive of you. And it took me a really long time to sit with that comfortably and be like, hold on, yeah, it ask, yes, it is about me, but it also isn't because cancer doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody around you. And it one of my best friends has a lot of a lot of trauma now because of she was by my side for basically every day. And she now has trauma around watching what I had to go through. Mm. And it's just, it does impact everyone differently. I think it's, I think it is really important just to recognize that the people outside of what's happening to is like, it's just as valid for them to feel as well. And I think that's, yeah, it is really an important thing yeah. to, um, to just to recognize going into it. Yeah. I yeah, thanks, Josh, for raising. I think particularly pointing out the the the, the, the um, experience that happens for carers and families as well. And we actually have a question um, that's that sort of um, comes from that, and that's around, you know, what do family and carers, um, um, you know, say and do when they see their you know loved one struggling and um, you know to you know in this post treatment phase. Um, you know, they often experience that sense of helplessness and not knowing what to say, um, as you mentioned, Josh. Um, 
do you have any suggestions and you know really from any of you Kate and Josh you know what did you find helpful um, from um, family friends um, support people um, what you know if there was anything helpful can you share that um, with us and then Carrie if you want to um, uh, chip in as well I think um, for me there's just going back to that idea of oh you look so well it's it's great to hear that you look well but there's a question that comes you're looking really well but how are you feeling <laughs> mm. so um and I think that we need to ask that of our carers as well if the people yeah. around us our kids yeah. our partners our families mm. um you know people who are experiencing other cancers I find that a very help you know it's just helpful yeah so it's asking that that extra question yeah. Because yeah, then it's that little bit out. further. Yeah, that's a compliment. Great. But actually getting that next question, that curiosity about how you're actually feeling or doing or, you know, what's going on. Yeah, not yeah. making the assumption that it's been three years, so you must have moved yeah. on now. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kate. Josh, did you want to add to that? Mm, no, I, I mean, for me, it's like more like in the other days, it's about communicating my expectations of things that I want to talk about the things that I don't want to talk about and my friend my friends and my family know me enough well enough by now it's like I don't want to talk about cancer anymore I, I yeah. like if I have something to say I'll tell you but the questions especially from people you don't you haven't seen for a long time you get the questions all the time so it's it's just that it's just that constant reminder and um, like when you when people ask you, oh, how have you been? It's like, oh gosh, I've seen what you've been going through. How's everything going? I'm like, it's okay for people that you don't know that well, who you might have like a somewhat collegial friend relationship with. But my expectation, my friends and family is like, look, everything's okay at the moment. If I have something to tell you about it, I'll tell you about it. But I'd rather I'd rather not discuss it because it's I'm I'm moving forward with my life and doing the things that make me happy, that make me feel fulfilled. I don't need to be reminded and brought back. A step because it just brings with it a little bit of like that anxiety and worry mm -hmm. yeah um so i would say a couple of things i think uh we also don't prepare family and friends and i agree i think i can't remember which of you kind of said it but um i mean cancer walks through the front door into a family we know it doesn't just come and impact the person and I use that term loosely. I use the term family loosely, loosely because it comes into a, a friendship group and it rocks the whole group in different ways. And yet, again, we're not great um, at the hospital end to, you know, going, okay, what does this family need? And what we know is one of the best things we can do for the person going through treatment is to help make sure their family's okay, you know, because we know that they're worrying about them. And... Kate, when you were talking about the kind of running up the mountain, we did some research with people who'd finished treatment for breast cancer and their partners, and we interviewed both of them separately. It was at the end of treatment. And one of the first things was just understanding how different their experiences were. And so whilst I was talking about the fact that when you're the one given this diagnosis and you have got to just get through family members are immediately going to what the hell is going to mean in our life. So very different places. And because we don't explain that very well, when treatment finishes, family and friends are going, oh, phew, we got through. And I remember one partner saying to me, he was a marathon runner, and he said, I paced myself like I do when I'm running a marathon until the day that I knew treatment was going to finish, which was Great for him, but not helpful for his partner who didn't even start processing until treatment finished. So then they both came to me going, why is she crying now? How come he's just moved on? Again, we set that up because we didn't actually explain. Of course, that's going to be a different experience. So um, that's part of it. The other thing is a lot of the statements like you look good almost come with a weight of a subtext of you look good please tell me this is all yes. over please tell me I don't have to worry anymore mm -hmm. um please confirm for me that because you've got your hair done and you're doing okay that I don't have to worry about this anymore 
Um, now, we're not saying that that is a subtext, it's a subconscious thing, but it adds to the weight of the person who has the cancer experience, that we're carrying this, we've got to make sure it looks all right because we know it's it's upset everyone so much. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, one of the things I often do is talk about how to respond to that kind of question of, yeah, yeah, thanks, I'm, you know, I do feel like I'm looking a bit better, but, you know, some of the, the stuff that I'm still dealing with, it's turned my life upside down. So I'm working through that. So you acknowledge both because we know that most of those comments they come with great desire of, you know, wanting to make sure you're better. You know, they come from a good place, but they're received often from a real weight um, on us. I would also say that there's been some pretty amazing uh, work that's been done around meaning for carers. And that's one of the things that I would do is actually be sitting with people and, and saying, uh, with family and friends, um, the same thing that I would be saying to you guys, can can we look at how you're spending your days and are you looking after yourself as well and that sort of stuff? Yeah. Uh, I think that's, yeah, poignant as well. But, again, it would be so much helpful if we set all of this when you're in the middle of going through it, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I think you've actually all responded in some form or another to one of the um pre-submitted questions which was around how do I communicate with others about the changes in my life um, and Carrie you touched it on it then and Josh you did um, too so thank you because I think that's a tricky one when when changes are happening um, for yourself and you're setting different expectations for yourself but others still have a different expectation how do we how do we get on the same page as that? Um, so I think, um, yeah, you pointed, um, you, you spoke about that really nicely, um, um, Josh and Carrie. Kate, did you want to add anything to that about how you communicated with others around that? No, um, no not very well, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. So, sorry, go ahead, Josh. We've got a few more questions. We'll 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 um, move through as well. Some really important ones that have come through. I won't um, I won't travel on this one. I'm just just one of the other comments was um about when we say I'm okay. Um, it's a it's a re it's it's a very it's a really easy thing to say. It's instinctual to say I'm okay because there's a lot of weight attached to saying that. There's a lot of expectation attached to that. It's no, we say, you know, I don't, we, I say I'm okay because I'm giving, I just want them to have, just to them to hear what I know that they need to hear. Because, like what I was saying earlier, everyone processes things differently. So, if it gives them the assurance for a little bit, I'll say I'm okay. And I'll, I'll talk to, I'll tell you if everything's not. Um, because we know that it does impact on people. It's, it's not an easy thing to hear, especially when you want to hear more and you have more questions. Um, but it's sometimes it is just it's the easiest thing to say because we don't want them to worry more than what they already probably are. Great suggestion, thanks, Josh. Mm -hmm. um, I, I there was a question that came up in the chat, um, and this is around um, any advice um, around um, working with young young people and children. Um, and, um, you know, what, you know, could, could you provide some guidance, Carrie, around where, you know, people, you know, where people could start to look for that, this type of support, but in a, in a different age, um, age mm. range? So I'm assuming that question is about the child being someone that's living with a blood cancer as opposed to being in a family. I mean, it doesn't, it, I can probably answer it generally, um, because it, the concepts are the same. Um, one of the, the, the beautiful things about kids is that they are cognitively um, built to see the world as them being the centre of their universe. And so as so one of the really important things is that, that kids feel like their whole world isn't going to change. So even though this is happening to them or to their parent or sibling, um, that they're still, if I think about what's what's meaningful for that child and it's footy once a week, 
that we understand that those things are, are if we can at, at all make sure that still happens in some way. So the same concept of what is meaningful, what brings this child joy, let's make sure there is still some of that happening in in amongst all of whatever else needs to happen um, is crucial. And so kids are the ones that you, you sit down and you'll tell them some really heavy news and they'll take it in and then they'll go, great, can we go outside and play now or can I go back on Xbox? Like, have you finished? And then we leave it open um, that, yep, you can and we can talk about this again and we can talk about this again and then they will come out of, you know, middle of dinner three weeks later and go, so can I just find out, does that mean A, B or C? Um, that's how kids work. It's a sweeping statement, I know, but um, but that's how we, we need to look at the fact that kids can actually cope with stuff. What they can't cope with is not knowing what's going on and the feeling that something is going on in this family and I'm even I'm being taken to hospital and I, and I think everyone's really worried but I'm not really being told. So that just as a platform that needs to happen. But the same thing is there. What those small things that bring that child joy, if there is any way to bring it in, to keep it in their life amidst all of the chaos, make sure you do that. And I, um, you know, I think one of the, one of the days when I smuggled a dog into the Alfred Hospital, um, these days I think I could probably talk my way in with a dog now, but in those days it was infection control concerns um, and it was small enough to go into my bag. Um, that was the the most important social work intervention I could have done for that woman. Yep. I could have talked about a whole lot of other things. We could have got some anti-anxiety medica. We could have done all sorts of things, but actually what they needed was their dog. And and I think we need to remember that regardless of the age of the yep. person. Yep. Um, yeah. I think you've really highlighted how accessible this is for any mm. in any age category, um, you know, that, you know, it, it it um, has applicability and relevance and um, we just need to think and listen really carefully, don't we, to what it is that people are needing. Um, yeah, I appreciate, um, appreciate you responding to that. Um, one of the things that we, you know, we're seeing so much more in, um, in the work we do, um, and I think it, it sort of has been highlighted um, post-pandemic, is the, you know, really the growing population of people who are living alone and the, mm. the you know, sense of isolation and, and loneliness that people experience. And one person um, um, put it in the, um, their question, um, you know, there's someone who they shared their experience of having no close family, spouse, children, few friends or a career, that they're getting older and they no longer see the point in having long-term goals and and see short-term goals as, as pointless and superficial. Um, what would you say, you know, if this person is here listening um, right now, what would you say to this person if they were, yeah, in a therapy session or just right now? Um, and, yeah, um, you know, can you just talk to that a little bit? And, and Kate and Josh, um, please um, um, jump in too um, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, thanks for that really easy question. Um, <laughs> no. Sorry, Carrie, for putting you on no, the No, no, it's a really, really important question. One of the things that I would say about loneliness is that um, the, I think the core of it is about me knowing what my core identity is and loneliness can be about not feeling a sense of significance in the world and to other people. And that comes when we have lived for some time without being in touch with who we are and what's important to us. It sounds like a very vague way of saying it. But um, if I was sitting with someone um, and it's an elderly person and they aren't able to leave the house very often and all of those restrictions, I would immediately be going to tell me about who you are and your story, and I would be wanting to link them in some way um, because loneliness is not about how many people you have in your life. Um, it is, do I feel like I matter in the world? And so it might be um, reminding you what is 
stuff that you is really cool to you and then trying to link you to some of that even if it is online and it's once a week and but it's about actually attaching ourselves back into ourselves as much as having connections with other people um i i mean if we could build a community around every person we'd be well and truly there in supporting we i'm sure we would have hardly any anxiety depression we would still have some but it would be okay because i'd be held um, but in the absence of that, I do think a big part of it is who are you at your core? How long has it been since you've been able to just be that person and be loved for it? And how do we reconnect you with that as much as anything? Mm -hmm. I'm listening to the um, audio book of The Happiest Man on Earth wow. at the moment, you know. I've read that. Yeah. And he is when he's reading this book, he's 102 and he's been through, you know, he went through Auschwitz and he went through hell and he will be the one that talks about, um, you know, the joy of just little moments. Um, but it's about do I know who I am and do I feel like I matter enough in the world? And I think that's the question we need to be asking and trying to work out how to reconnect people in with that. That sounds vague, but yeah. I think that's where I'd be starting. Yeah. That okay. So that sense of connection to self, and I think the other, I think you and it resonated with me because I actually wrote it down. You said connection to humanity. So yeah. it's not so much about people, humans, but humanity as a whole. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And I do think, um, I think the last few years, and actually probably the last two years I think of in the world has thrown us all into this questioning of what the hell are we doing here and who does actually matter and you know I think a lot of us have been really questioning that and so looking back into that and trying to find that core again is really important and this what I noticed during COVID as an example is um the isolation during COVID brought two things. One is that we we were no longer being reflected in other people's faces. So, you know, when we'd maybe go to the same place and get coffee every morning and we'd say hi and the person would go, you know, hi, Carrie, have a great day, I would actually know I was human and that I was liked and that I was connected and I and that was happening from when I'd just go and get a coffee. It, yeah. it is about just having those those small moments of humanity that we still know the world's a good place and people are good and it's been harder to accept that with things that have happened in the last couple of years perfect handing over to kate because now i'm just bringing yeah, the whole kate. Thing oh, this is actually going back to my pre leukemia career i worked with a lot of very vulnerable people including a lot of people with disability or older people who were very socially isolated and I found when I was writing this uh, piece, you know, I was really uncomfortable because I'm really conscious that I'm very fortunate to be so connected. And I wanted to acknowledge that to, to say, yes, there are so many people in our community that aren't well connected. But connecting back in um, to your comment, I think that's so true, connecting with that core of who you are. One of... Um, and your values, finding your values, because you don't need to have another person to connect to that. So I love nature and animals. And one of the most meaningful parts of my day is um, I've got all kinds of birds in my garden that come down, including some endangered gang gangs, and just marvelling at how beautiful they are, marvelling at how lucky I am to have them, to be able to have this quiet moment in the day, to listen to the magpies sing. Mm. All of those things appeal to me and make me feel gratitude that I'm still here to enjoy it. So there's that that kind of connection to nature or animals or a tree and looking at a lot of older people who are socially um, isolated those kinds of things, helping someone notice those things that they do have, starting with what you have, use what you can. Mm -hmm. There's always something we can find if we take time with a person to truly listen, be curious and find those things that really would give them that. Well, lovely, 
yeah, it's a lovely note to um, to start to wrap up, um, Kate. Um, thank you so much um, to Carrie, Kate and Josh for this just incredible conversation. Um, there has been so much commentary in the chat. I'm I'm I haven't had a chance to look over all of it, but I, I think what it sort of what it suggests is that people are really resonating with this conversation. And uh, and I think there's that that real sense of from what I can see, that validation of the of their experience. Um, so thank you so much for being so generous uh, with your time and 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 sharing with us, you know, um, uh, your very personal stories. Um, Jenny, I'll hand back to you um, to just close out for today. Thanks. Oh, it feels rude. This is such a beautiful, tender moment and the conversation, <laughs> even in the chat, has been incredibly thoughtful and wide-ranging and deep and I feel like we could have this conversation for another two hours Um I think it really has been an incredible day and such a beautiful thing to be a part of. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that for all of you that have joined us today and who are struggling with having blood cancer or caring for someone with cancer, it, it is an ongoing challenge. So I would encourage you to use this information to start conversations, to re-watch this, to pick up different tips to, to not give up, to keep looking for the little things in each day. Um, I think someone in the conversation called them a ladybug moment, otherwise known as glimmers, looking for those little things in every day because it's very rare for a whole day to be absolutely awful. There's usually some little thing. I think the only other thing we would love to say, apart from being grateful for everyone who's presented and everyone who's attended, is that if you have any questions or concerns or this raises things for you, call us connect connect is the word so we've put it in the chat but that 1800 620 420 number bang it somewhere you can see it and and when you get stuck call us you know it just help you get over that hump i think the other thing is to remember that we will send you a recording of this because i feel for myself you need i probably need to watch it three times to absorb all of the luscious and valuable information and when you get an email from us asking for some feedback, please, if you have the time and the energy, tell us from the bottom of your heart what you really think because we genuinely use that to shape this program and deliver these things to you. So thank you deeply for joining us all today.